Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Louis B. and Louise Hirschfeld Coleman, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, and contributions to participating stations. Coming up, very small satellites are doing very big science. This is an experiment to recreate the conditions in the very early stages of our solar system and understand the very first steps of planet formation. And an experiment on the International Space Station that may help astronauts get to Mars and beyond. If you're going to have any type of long-term space travel, you're going to need plants for oxygen production and for food. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Exploring outer space is generally a very expensive proposition, but a new generation of tiny satellites is opening up the heavens to academic teams, small businesses, even students. And it all began with a school assignment. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. October 4th, 1957, a small metal sphere that does no more than emit a beep ushers in the space age and quickly leads to technological wonders in communications, science, national defense, and much more. Typically, satellites are large, very complex, and very expensive spacecraft. The cost to develop, design, build, test, launch, and maintain one can be hundreds of millions of dollars. But is it possible to democratize access to space? Enter CubeSats. A CubeSat is basically a tiny spacecraft, a tiny satellite. They come in units of cubes that are 10 centimeters on a side in either one, two, three, or six units. The idea for CubeSats originated with an academic exercise. Dr. Bob Twiggs at Stanford University in the late 90s walked into a classroom with a Beanie Baby box and asked his students for your final project to develop a spacecraft within this box that could do some type of science on on orbit. And from that, it just took off. People started building more and more and more of them. And so the standard kind of stuck. Of course, democratizing space means getting things into orbit cheaply. For CubeSats, that means hitchhiking a ride. Today, there are two ways that we can get CubeSats into orbit. The first is to fly them as auxiliary cargo on an unmanned rocket that's going into space to carry a larger primary spacecraft. The second is to fly them up to the International Space Station as cargo and then deploy them. Because all CubeSats are built to a strict size standard, engineers were able to design a simple, inexpensive deployer. So what we have here is the Poly Pico Orbital Deployer, or PPOD for short. It's 30 by 10 by 10 centimeters on the inside for the specification of the CubeSat. And once the signal is received from the launch vehicle, it will release its bolt, the door will come open, and inside is a pusher spring that pushes the CubeSat out. And then it's on its merry way to go do with science. Since the first CubeSats were launched in 2003, several hundred have flown. Many have been designed and built by university teams. One of my favorite examples is Griffix. And Griffix was intended to go demonstrate a very small imaging chip that was brand new, new technology that JPL wanted to use on a larger, very expensive spacecraft. By flying this little chip on a CubeSat and demonstrating that it worked well in, in low Earth orbit, they were able to buy down a tremendous amount of risk before they actually go take this new piece of technology and invest it into a hundreds of million dollar spacecraft. Addy Dove is developing a CubeSat that will likewise provide valuable information to future spacecraft designers. Our CubeSat is called SurfSat. It's a satellite that's gonna be studying surface charging. And what that means is we'll have different types of materials on the outside of our little CubeSat. This is very practical applications for any satellite orbiting the Earth to understand if it's gonna have a static discharge event that could ruin the electronics on the spacecraft or ruin the outside of the spacecraft. And so we want to come up with ways to understand when that's gonna happen and ways to mitigate that or prevent it from happening. Statistics. Josh Caldwell is building a CubeSat called QPACE. This is an experiment to recreate the conditions in the very early stages of our solar system or any planetary system and understand the very first steps of planet formation. 
So the main components of the experiment are a microcontroller, that's the computer that operates the experiment. We have batteries that are powered by solar panels on the outside of the experiment. And then the experiment itself is a chamber with particles that is mounted on springs, flexible supports, and we have three solenoids that we use to cause this test cell to vibrate, and those uh, vibrations cause the particles in the chamber to move and bounce off each other, and then we follow with our camera the evolution of the velocities or the speeds of those particles as they collide. QPACE is a perfect example of how a spacecraft can be built inexpensively. We first make a 3D design using CAD software. Then we make a 3D printed prototype to make sure that the design that we've got on paper actually works. And then using components such as the solar cells, we're using some common consumer components, a GoPro camera to collect video, a Raspberry Pi microcontroller. Caldwell's CubeSat proves that a very small spacecraft can do very big science. One of the big questions that I think we face as a species is, are we alone? And one of the big pieces of that puzzle is, how many planets are there out in the rest of the galaxy? What kinds of planets are they? Are they close to their stars? Are they far away? Do other solar systems look like our own? Or is ours relatively unusual? So understanding the process of planet formation will help us address those questions, help us understand how unique or common a planetary system like our own is in the galaxy, and how common a planet like the Earth that is hospitable and habitable for life might be. Going forward, CubeSats will continue to democratize access to space, and they have the potential to provide breakthroughs in both science and technology. I think the future of CubeSats for space science is very bright. As we gain more experience with the limitations of the form factor, the cost will come down, we'll understand how to take advantage of the size. So you can send them to little environments that you might not be able to send a big expensive spacecraft. And you can also do a lot of different science in different places if you have a lot of little CubeSats. And the ability to place large numbers of CubeSats into orbit to work together opens up vast possibilities. If I put a constellation of small satellites that serve as internet nodes for communication, theoretically we can create a situation where you can get online using a small antenna from anywhere in the world. That's a capability that doesn't exist today and it might do a lot to help areas in the world that are underserved by the internet. I think our imagination is the only real limit in terms of making use of CubeSat and the CubeSat platform to do a number of different things. On July 14, 2015, the New Horizons spacecraft made history by flying by Pluto. We spoke with Dr. Alan Stern, the mission's principal investigator, a few weeks before. Five months later, we again sat down with Dr. Stern for an update on some of the surprising findings of the New Horizons mission. Pluto flyby went spectacularly well. We conducted over 500 scientific observations and it all performed flawlessly. I'm most surprised by how complicated Pluto is. I expected it to be complicated, but this is beyond my wildest expectation. Sometimes it makes my head hurt. We were surprised that a small planet could be so complicated and that it could be so active after four billion years, and the geophysicists are still scratching their heads over that. The Pluto system is really a scientific wonderland. It's the diversity of landforms on the surface, from glacial landforms to enormous ice plains the size of the state of Texas, to a wide variety of different mountain ranges, to tectonics, to clear interactions between the atmosphere and the surface. In some cases, even indicate that liquid may have flowed on the surface of Pluto in the past. It's amazing. We found that Pluto has had a very complicated history over the last four billion years, and we found that people really love exploration. There was kind of a viral wave around the flyby of interest by people of all walks of life on every continent of the Earth. Well, the spacecraft is now several hundred million miles beyond Pluto, speeding outward through the solar system to what we hope will be a second flyby in early 2019. Meanwhile, it's transmitting data to the ground every day. We took a lot of data at Pluto, and it will take us most of the way through late 2016 to get all the data to the ground. If multi-year trips to Mars and other celestial bodies are ever to become a reality, astronauts will probably have to grow plants on their spaceships. 
An experiment on the International Space Station may help determine how to do that. This was our view where we got to watch the launch from, so that's mm -hmm. the SpaceX Dragon at full zoom on my camera. So Six, it's five, four, three, two, one, engine ignited, and we have liftoff of SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. It was super cool to get something <laughs> on the space station. Yeah, I, I actually brought my five-year-old out when it was up there, and then we went out to the park and like watched the space station go over our head with the science on there, which was really cool. Southern Illinois University Edwardsville professor Darren Lussie is fascinated by plants. What stresses them out? What makes them happy? He's particularly interested in two forces that impact early plant growth, light and gravity. So gravity is really important for plants, especially when they're little. So if you think you put a seed underground, it has a little bit of energy in the seed with it. But So he has all these questions. What happens if you do this? What happens if you do that? and we grow them straight up and down and then turn the plate on its side and then they start responding to gravity. Just he like can do a lot of things in the laboratory, cut off the food supply, turn off the lights. What he can't do is shut off the gravity. So he and a collaborator at Ohio University designed an experiment to send thousands of tiny seeds into space to get them to sprout in the weightlessness of the International Space Station. When we're sending things to the space station, they grow on little petri dishes. Each plate gets about 800 seeds, between 800 and 1,000 seeds. Yeah. Yeah. What do you want to find out? We want to find out what a plant thinks is happening to it in space. Well, why do you want to know that? I want to know it for, I guess, three basic reasons. One is curiosity. <laughs> one, is, one, one is definitely curiosity. So if you NASA doesn't have the time or space on its rockets to simply satisfy the curiosity of random scientists. All right, come on back. There's more to NASA show you. NASA does want to know a lot about how plants respond and grow in space without I gravity. NASA wants to know what kind of stress are they under and what can they do to fix it. Is this because if you're going to Mars, you're going to have a garden <laughs> on your spaceship? That's exactly right. So if you're going to have any type of long-term space travel, you're going to need plants for oxygen production and for food. The foods here. Uh, it's Let's like say you wanted the Mars astronauts to grow and eat bean sprouts. Well, even if they looked and tasted the same, how would we know if the ones growing in space were as nutritious as those grown on Earth? So NASA puts out calls for experiments that can begin to help answer those kinds of questions. And the one proposed by Professor Lussie in Ohio University's Sarah Wyatt was accepted. So they packed up their experiment and, with a couple of grad students, traveled to Cape Canaveral. Yeah, that's exciting NASA stuff meatball. to me. It was exciting, yeah. yeah. We brought all this stuff with us. This is the lab at NASA. We brought all this stuff with us in this big suitcase, and we wrapped up. We brought the media that we were going to put in the Petri dishes in these bottles. This is the most sterile environment you can imagine. So the person in the hood... All the experiments that go to the space station have to meet exacting size and weight limits. So they have, there's this, there's this, like everything is super well worked out with the NASA engineers. So there's a bunch of... And to be clear here, they weren't really planning to grow anything an astronaut would want to eat. They're growing stuff that only a scientist could love. This is where we grow all of our plants. So this is what they look like. You can see them some in their various stages. The experiment of involves Arabidopsis plants. In our world, it's a weed, but it's one of the most common plants used in research. Small genome, quick life cycle, sort of the fruit fly of plant research. But Professor Lussie didn't need to see how big it would grow on the space station. He just wanted to see what was going on deep inside the cells of the plant. And all he needed for that was to get it to sprout in space. its way towards the International Space Station, 150 meters away now. Station in uh, Dragon. The seeds went into space in a dormant state. When they arrived at the space station, they were brought to life and allowed to just begin to sprout. After only 72 hours, the astronauts injected a fixative to stop the growing, then packed them up and sent them home on the next cargo ship back to Earth. Dragon back on its own uh, after a month at the International Space Station, returning uh, almost 4,000 pounds of uh, critical science experiments, uh, as well as uh, other equipment uh, that will splash down. We're going to grind up all the plants and extract proteins from some of them and RNA from others. 
and we're going to then sequence every protein, count everything we have, and compare it to all the proteins that are there, and then compare it to a sample that was identically grown on the ground, and see which genes a plant turns on in space, and then converts into proteins. Vegetables, cereals. If you've ever had a garden that didn't go well, you know that when the plants aren't happy, you don't get nearly as much as you want from it. So keeping them happy is pretty important for NASA. When they want to go to Mars, which is going to be probably in the late 2020s or early 2030s, they're going to need some kind of plants growing to make that trip possible. Hey, if you got $30 million to spend on a spacecation, why not spend $15 million more and take a 90-minute spacewalk while you're up there? That's no joke. Space Adventures, the company that acts as the middleman for the ISS-bound space tourists, is currently marketing the opportunity to become the first private citizen to walk in space. You can also book passage on a voyage to the far side of the moon. There are two seats. One has reportedly already been sold, and the others can be yours for a cool $150 million. The Explorers Club was founded in 1904 to promote exploration and scientific research. Reporter Emily Driscoll takes us on a private tour of the collection at the club. Exploration without science is adventure, and probably nothing more than that. My name is Will Roseman, and I'm the executive director of the Explorers Club. The Explorers Club is an organization that was formulated with the intent to explore and to advance scientific exploration. The collection is a reminder of great accomplishments, and you can't walk through this building without seeing extraordinary things. Well, the artifacts are typically things that were collected from members along the way. Our members were first to the North Pole, first to the South Pole, Amundsen and Perry and Hansen, first to the summit of Everest. In fact, Sir Edmund Hillary was our honorary president up until his death. First to the deepest points of the ocean, Don Walsh, who went down to the Marianas Trench in 1960 with Jacques Picard. And of course, 1969, when Neil Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin went to the moon. We have a plaque outside. There's a space there for the first member to walk on Mars. And there are other individuals that have been extraordinarily important Thor Heidel was a very prominent member, and he had a theorem that the Polynesian islands were populated by South Americans. Before 1947, he had gone to National Geographic and other organizations, and they scoffed at the idea. And then he came to the Explorers Club. He presented uh, what he had hoped to do, and he utilized the globe outside to actually exhibit what his expedition would include and why it was important. And instantly our members saw that there was some merit there. And we not only helped him raise the money, but helped organize the expedition. Other things that I love are the William R. Lee paintings that are in our hallway. Uh, for anyone that's ventured to the American Museum of Natural History and seen the famous Akeley dioramas. We have the paintings from which they were created. Well, many of the stuffed animals, so to speak, that we have in the trophy room very much represent a different era. They were actually specimens, some originally meant for the American Museum of Natural History. Some, in fact, were at the American Museum of Natural History and then subsequently ended here. We have a Yeti scalp that was brought here by Marlon Perkins of Mutual Omaha fame and Sir Edmund Hillary. Uh, that was used to actually show that it really wasn't a Yeti scalp. I guess if I had to name one single best artifact, for me it would be the Apollo 11 moon flag uh, that was taken by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin when they walked on the moon. And it's important to me not just because of the extraordinary achievement, but the impact that it still has with us even today. And it's also a reminder to me that we should continue space exploration uh, and beyond that. We plant our flag not so much to claim the area, but to claim it really for science. Our members go on average uh, 600 to 1,000 expeditions per year but only 50 or 60 qualified to carry the Explorers Club flag. And many of these flags have been on 20, 30 expeditions. 
A flag gets retired if it's done something extraordinary. The flag is from 1955 and had gone in 19 expeditions and had been to the summit of Everest twice. One of our members took down to the Marianas Trench. So it's the only item in the world that's been to the highest points on Earth and to the lowest points on Earth. And interestingly enough, that's a member, James Cameron, who's probably better known for being a director. When people apply for a flag to carry on their expedition, they have to prove that what they're doing is extraordinary and different. And I think that's a great indication of what our club stands for. They're extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, all in the name of science. I invite people to come and visit us. It's really exciting for me to see the expressions on people's faces. And people are just flabbergasted. Everyone's a child when they come here. And they see things with new eyes and they experience incredible things. A team of British engineers is building a supersonic car they hope will set a land speed record of 1,000 miles an hour and inspire the next generation of engineers. Engineering projects don't come much more challenging than this. A team of UK engineers are aiming to smash the land speed record by building a supersonic car that will travel at 1,000 miles per hour. The Bloodhound supersonic car is being built by the same team that set the current land speed record of 763 miles per hour almost 20 years ago now. Ex-RAF pilot Andy Green will be behind the driving wheel again as he attempts to secure a new record in South Africa next year. The Bloodhound supersonic car is the most extraordinary straight line racing car in history. It's a car that will do 1,000 miles an hour. It is a blend of part jet supersonic jet fighter. It is part Formula One uh, racing car technology and it is part next generation space rocket. The car is being built here in a hangar on the outskirts of Bristol. It will contain over 3,500 components sourced from the best engineering companies around the world. This includes a one ton Rolls-Royce jet engine from a Eurofighter Typhoon and a cluster of Norwegian Namo hybrid rockets developed to power the next generation of space launchers. Does the project show how good British engineering is? Absolutely. So some of our key technical partners, the likes of Rolls-Royce, some of the most difficult parts of the car to solve have been solved here in the UK. About 90% of our supply chain is UK-based, but it's a reality of the technology and how it's spread over the globe that about 10% of our partners are international. So we have partners in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Japan, in North America, and we've needed all of these technologies together to solve this problem. The £41 million project, funded by about 300 companies, is not just about setting new records, but it also hopes to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers by showing them exactly how exciting the field can be. Fairfield High School in Bristol is one of 5,700 UK schools that are involved in the Bloodhound project. I think it's really interesting because um, it is quite inspirational. A lot of us at school were talking about it sort of thing. Um, I, I like the idea of breaking the land for record and bringing schools into it as well because obviously they need more engineers, so I think it's a good idea. Today we were just building some connect cars basically to just test our rocket pressure kind of ideas and just making a support that works, just basic chassis and things like that, but yeah, just making a car basically. I would very much consider becoming an engineer, even if it, you know, everyone thinks, oh, engineering is so practical, so hands-on. It, it can be hands-on if you want to go in that direction with it, but you can also go in this other crazy direction of making wacky, innovative ideas that's just ridiculous, and you can go like that instead. Whether the project will succeed in its aim to address the crippling skill shortage impacting Britain's engineering sector will remain to be seen. But for now, the focus will be on finishing the car ready for low-speed testing in Newquay this summer. If all goes to plan, Team Bloodhelm will look to reach 800 miles per hour in South Africa this October before attempting the 1,000 miles per hour speed record next year. The most difficult question in the world to answer is, what does it feel like? I'm a jet fighter pilot. I'm used to jet-powered vehicles, supersonic uh, travel, etc. So it's a bit like my day job. But again, if you don't fly supersonic jet fighters, that's not going to help you. 
Um, it is the most extraordinary experience. It's very intense, it's physically uncomfortable. It's a small cockpit, it's very hot, incredibly noisy. Acceleration of 2G, deceleration of 3G, that's 60 miles an hour per second the speed is coming off. All of that as background noise, which I have to shut out while I'm fighting to control an eight-ton vehicle developing the equivalent of 135,000 thrust horsepower, which will be on the limits of stability at three or 400 miles an hour. So I'll be fighting the steering through the solid metal wheels on the loose, slippery, dried lake bed surface in South Africa, while the rocket's firing and accelerating us at that incredible speed. All of that as a background, it's going to be enormously challenging, but also the most enormous privilege and opportunity to be able to develop that car as part of the, the most extraordinary land speed record team of all time. It's going to be a tremendous experience. We can't wait to get started. One thing for sure, the Bloodhound Project has already got more people, and in particular school children, talking about British engineering and just how exciting it can be. That's all for this week on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Louis B. and Louise Hirschfeld Coleman, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, and contributions to participating stations.